What a blessing. Um, and I mean that. I don't think I've said this. And maybe it's too much to say, but I hope you will understand my heart in it. I have not been as excited in this excited in ministry for years. I mean, and that's a lot. It's saying a lot, and and saying a lot about condition of my heart at times. But it's also saying a lot about the freedom which the Lord has given, and all those songs talked about that. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, and He is our anchor. And we have and are focusing on some things that I think are incredible for us. Last week, we had Dr. Ed Gross teach a a discipleship class that was five hours of teaching, and we didn't lose anyone. No one was slain the spirit at that point. They were gone. They were they were they were mostly engaged and coming up to me afterwards and saying, "Hey, what's next? It's coming. It's coming." Then he brought a beautiful message last week about the idea of every one of us has an opportunity to turn. No matter what your situation, no matter what the condemnation, no matter what the situation, however things are, you have an opportunity to turn, and Jesus is right there when you do. And to reject that, to reject that is a decision to reject his best for you and right relationship with Jesus is a decision in and of itself. So, you know, that that prompted some conversations. Now, for us, so I've told you this, this season has been about foundations, which we're getting ready to review. Freedom, which is just, um, just amazing in and of itself. The opportunity that we have three full groups we have people asking to get in, and it's, it, we just can't. It'll, it'll take away from the sizing of the group. Um, but that just leaves room for next time. But we have these foundations that we can focus on, and we have fellowship that we can have one to, with another. So turn to Hebrews 6, and I feel like I need to freshen this up for everybody. Does anyone know, uh, if you had to say, what is it we're talking about right now in Hebrews? Speak up. The basics. The basics. How many of them are there? There are six. Six basics. Six things that the Scripture says if you state that you're a Christian. Now, I want to I mind, mind you here, don't feel guilty. My goal is not this. But there are six things that if you don't have as your basic tenets of the faith you're going to deviate and miss out on all that God has for you. Six things. So I focused on what was beyond those six things, but God made it very clear that we as a body needed to regroup and restart with the basics. So Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ That doesn't mean you leave it, leave it. That means it's like you're done with it. And go on to maturity. Who here is a Christian that wants to be mature? Okay, good, good. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God and instructions about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So if you were to claim and are to claim to be a Christian, you should have a solid foundation on what these six things are. Now, there is no, I want you to feel bad if you don't get it all. This is what we're here for. We're here to start back. So the first one, just very basically, and it's not basic. I believe it's there for a huge reason. Repentance from dead works. There is nothing that you can do to earn the favor of God. In Christ, there is nothing, but because of Christ, you can walk in his favor. So 
You can choose to work all your life to try to show God how good of a Christian you are and think that that is what gives you right relationship with him. But it is not. It is what his son has done and what and the love that he shared and poured on us that we can confess him and say, I am in Christ, I am a son or a daughter in Christ, and nothing can separate me from the love of God. So if your mindset, and it's so easy, man, I haven't been honoring God very good, and you, you start condemning yourself. Well, we know Romans 8 says, there, now therefore there is what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's scripture. That's not my thought process. It's not, no, I don't mean like that. That's not just me saying something. That's what God's word says. So if you're here wrestling with, well, I'm not a really good Christian, I might go, okay, do you know the really good Savior? Do you know him? And not just intellectually, not just be able to say, oh, he's the son of God. But at some point in your life that there has been fruit produced by following Jesus. You know, in Luke 4, or uh, yeah, Luke, it has the different seeds that come about and how they go. So it's like, are you somebody that has just claimed Christ once, but there's been no fruit? There's been no reproduction. There's been no change that you cannot explain. It used to be when I was in... Um, high school and middle school youth ministry, the going thing was just really to ask people, have you made a decision for Christ? And I, I think that's, that's sketchy. But I would say this, is there fruit in your life that you can't explain by your effort? You know, and it's like, okay, it's like, but God, but God did this, but God do this. And so Repentance from dead work should be the basics where it's no longer what you're doing to earn God's favor, but that his favor is flowing through you. And, it's, and it goes back to this being a vessel that your repentance removes the cork so that you can live in a repentant life. We should live in repentance daily. I mean, how many know that you're a sinner? You know? Daily, repentance is daily. And so you take the cork off and you say, God, here it is. Here it is again. <laughs> Fill me. Fill me. And he fills me. And then, you know, we can't just cork it up and hope for the best because then we become still water, bitter water. But we're called to be poured out. And so that should be a daily thing for us, filling and pouring out. So repentance from dead works. That has to be, that's, I believe that's number one for a reason. Your basic understanding, there's nothing you can do in Christ to, to attain God's favor, but you walk in it. Anyone got tired of working to please God? That's not by the Spirit. But when you're pleasing God by working, and you're finding joy in it, that's the Spirit. That's Him working. So, goes on to... Um, Faith towards God, we spent a lot of time in the church, trust. Faith equals trust, that I'm going to trust God no matter what the situation. Kennedy said and Abby said, there's a lot of things going on I don't know about. There's things that you might be hiding that I don't know about. I don't know about it all, but it's like, are you going to trust Jesus in this season when you can't see him? Are you going to trust him? Faith towards God is not just, just oh, I've got faith. It is literally knowing his word and trusting it and walking in it. Do you have faith towards God? The third one we talked about two weeks ago is, um, it, it says in this version anyway, it talks about the instructions about washings, and it's plural, and that pretty much means baptism. So there is a repentance baptism uh, that John talked about. There is a believer's baptism, and I'm just broadly hitting some areas. There's a believer's baptism that people follow after. But then there's also a baptism in the Spirit that takes place afterwards. That should be sort of a continual thing that you realize, I, I am not strong enough. I cannot do this. I need the Spirit of God to work in me. And so you'd be open to that, should be open to that. And then we get to um, the laying on of hands, the laying on of hands. Now, when I was in high school, the laying on of hands meant this. 
I'm going to lay on some hands on somebody. They stepped over, stepped their ground. Where that meant, you know, uh, you know, it's just bad. It's not, it was not good. But the laying on of hands. And what we're going to have happen today, I'm going to teach on this. And then my brother Rob is going to come up here and he's going to say a few words about his experience. And then he's actually going to demonstrate on what it looks like to lay on of hands. But I want to give you an overview. Okay, so the laying on of hands in the Old Testament can mean to bless. You might remember the blessing that takes place with Jacob and Esau and all that went on there, a father's blessing to his child, his son. It can be your blessing, your your daughter, and just putting your hand on her and saying what a blessing she is to you and asking God to impart that you're laying on of hands. Now, there is a couple things that are important about this. The one, the one thing I want to get you to think about is just personal touch. My daughter, as you, many of you know, is a NICU nurse. And the thing that breaks her heart is all the babies that come in there without parents. To have this little, little, and I mean little, two pounds something little, with no one there. In, in, a, in a, an enclosed space. And my daughter will talk about how she will go and she will, you know, if it's a little, real little ones that you can't go in, it, she will go in with those in, through the, in the uh, protective space and, and hold and touch the little one and how they respond to it. It is said that a child that lacks personal touch will suffer for that often for the rest of their lives. We experienced this during COVID. I mean, you just think about, they, they're doing studies now about even just the look of a smile being blocked. But the personal touch of, of holding somebody instead of, you know, being distant, like, I felt like Walter Payton is like, oh, you got you to gotta stay away because we were forced to do this stuff at work. You don't know who Walter Payton is. I'm sorry. He's a running back for the Bears. But um, we, we, we learned that we've got to separate. And what happened? People lost touch. I am so grateful that Laura was here for, for covid I mean that. I am so grateful because, I mean, I think I'd have lost my mind, and God used that time in a beautiful way. But not having personal touch. I still remember on Easter Sunday, I believe, Kennedy, you preached. It was a couple, man, it seems like forever ago. I wasn't here for Easter. We were over there, and I remember my son and daughter coming to the window and like, hey, you know, and it's just like we had COVID, and it was just like, and it just felt it's not right. You know, it's your children, it's your family. And so what I love now, and what is probably awkward for some of you, is that we are a people who touch one another, who hug one another. You know, and some of y'all might initially be doing this, and it might feel awkward at first. You know, they used to have, they had youth group skits about the proper way to distance yourself and how to hug a Christian brother or sister. At Liberty University, you couldn't, like, it was sort of like you had to create space and lean in and, like, no more than two taps. You know, if you were there too long, you know, and I get why. But really what it, what it taught me is that, you know, it's almost like these women are to be feared because something's going to happen if, if I hug them. You know, and, and it, it, it sort of didn't, it didn't create the, for me anyway, it created something else. But we have become a touchy church. And I mean it in the best of ways, not, not creepy. And I'll, just, and I'll just say this, I'll just say this. You ladies, you have a guy that's creepy, you come let me know. He'll find out. All right. So, guys, if you're creepy, 
Toby Keith just died, but I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm good once as I ever was. You know? <laughs> uh, sorry, I digress. All right. So, uh, that was way too much. I'm sorry. So we have the blessing of laying on of hands. We have a transference of authority or leadership. And, and if you've ever been in the military, you'll, you'll see people bring their flags up and they'll do a transfer of command. In the ministry, that can happen when you have someone come on, the laying on of hands of praying for them as an elder or a deacon or something like that. There is a transference of authority that takes place. It's not an authority that comes from me or the elders. It is authority that comes from God that just is like saying we're recognizing that this person has been walking in the Lord and we just want to ask for God's blessing. In a sense, it should not be viewed as power from the person laying on the hands. It should be seen as a servanthood that we are being channeled in a sense by God and his spirit flows through us and into this other person. So it's nothing about me or whoever lays on the hands. It's all about the Lord and surrender and sacrifice to him. So we have a transfer of leadership. We have it to ready a sacrifice to where they used to lay on their hands on a lamb. You remember that? Before they're going to sacrifice it. Now, I did this. I did this on an Easter week before a Seder to a baby lamb. I held it, and it was affectionate. Yeah, I know, lady, you're just like going gonna, gonna to hate me for this story. But then we sacrificed it. And the reality of the the sacrifice of that little lamb was foreshadowing of the pure, unblemished lamb that we read about in the Passover, that we read about in the Gospels, Jesus Christ who came without sin and that he was going to be sacrificed on your behalf. So there there is a laying on of hands to ready a sacrifice to prepare you know, so it, it, can be, it can be deep. Then you see in Mark, there's a dedication of children. And if you've seen up here, usually if the baby is cooperating, I will hold the child. And usually what I have to do is acclimate that child to my ugly self. I'm like, before the service, I'll be like, can you come and let me hold him or her now? Because I don't want them to be like, oh gosh, you know, who's that guy? But there's something about holding a precious child and just going, God, we are asking you. We're asking you to bless this child. And frankly, dedication is just as much about that child as it is the mom or dad or the guardians of that child. Are they going to dedicate their life to serving that little one? So we have this baby dedication. There's warnings about laying on of hands. In 1 Timothy, it says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Um, Dr. Gross, the part I caught on before he prayed over anyone. Did anyone hear that he prayed over last week? Just raise your hand for me, right? Did you hear him explain? Like, you can't be willy-nilly about praying over somebody. Now, if you're free in Christ and God says it, absolutely go for it. But you don't want to just lay hands quickly in, in a sense of establishing them in leadership. It warns that in eldership. But also, you're just going to do it because it's the Christian thing to do, but there is a lot of rebellion in your heart. Woe to you. It's, it's similar to me than the careful checking your heart before you come to communion. So you don't want to lay hands on quickly. The sixth one is the laying on of hands to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we touched on that some, and we're going to continue to touch on it to some degree. But this really means that you get to a place in your Christian walk that maybe you find out that you... Your dead works have been running you ragged. 
man, Eric, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm just going over and over. And maybe you need, uh, uh, Symbola talked about it, fresh fire, a fresh anointing by the Spirit. And submitting yourself and saying, I need to be filled by the Spirit. And going to someone you trust and saying, would you pray for me? Someone that you know their life. Not just some person on the street, but someone that you know their walk is consistent and saying, God, would you fill me with your spirit? And lastly, but not least, is to heal the sick. So I need to ask you a question. And I need this to be not head knowledge, but in your heart. You know, I don't even want you to answer me. Do you believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that God can heal you? In Mark 16, it goes, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So you might just go, wait a minute, what do you mean about them snakes, Eric? Did you all hear that? Did you think it? Did you think about this? Snakes, you just let snakes bite. You see them cats in West Virginia that have those rattlesnakes? You ever seen that? And they run all around them rattlesnakes wrapped around their arm? Homie, don't play that. You know, I, I'm not going to do that. But I have enough trust that if God calls me to Australia and I'm in the bush with the Aboriginal people and one of those snakes grabs a hold of me, I believe that God can neutralize that venom and allow me to keep ministering on. You see the difference? It's Paul was bitten by a snake when he was doing ministry. He wasn't showing off in front of people, showing what they could do. And I mean, I watch these documentaries, and I just, you know, they're going to find out. That's all I keep saying. I just watch that snake. I mean, my brother Rob has held a snake, but it wasn't a rattlesnake at our house, and he overcame that fear. But, who are you laughing at? Emily? <laughs> I know, you're like wild kingdom at your house, too, you know. But we're not doing it to show that we are something, so when we pray for a healing, we're not just going, I'm like this apostolic, apostolic person that has the power, is going to do all this to you. No, we are vessels which the Spirit can fill, and then we can not only bless, not only give authority to, but we can ask for God's healing in a person's life. So it's interesting in, Ma in Matthew 10, it says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely have you received, freely give. So to cleanse out those with leprosy, you had to be among them. So I just want to prepare us. And I, I haven't asked the elder permission for this, and y'all can fire me later. As long as I'm pastor here, Unless there is some ridiculous amount of evidence, we are not shutting the doors down for any pandemic. Because, because here, in order to heal the lepers, you had to be among the lepers. Right? I don't see Jesus going, oh, Walter Payton. No, they got leprosy. I can't be among them. Remember, he was among sinners, and you should be thankful for that. He went among drunkards. He went among prostitutes. He didn't shun. Oh, they're beneath me. So we need to live without fear and be so open and be so filled that when God uses us, that we can see the filling, we can see the healing, we can see the anointing, we can see the blessing, and I have a dream that our children will be prayed over more in this church, that our kids will be trained 
when they go to another place and no one's praying a blessing on them, they're going to go, what is wrong with this place? But that's going to take time. That is going to take time. So we have to be filled. Now, here's a requirement for asking for healing prayer. This is from the Amplified Version. Is anyone among you sick? He must call. He must. She must. Call for the elders or spiritual leaders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It is a prayer of faith. Faith equals what? Trust. Trust. It is a prayer of trust. It's not me. And God isn't always going to heal every time. God isn't always going to do stuff, but we are called to go in faith. It's much like evangelism. We're called to go out and preach the gospel. We're not called to save people. We don't have that power, but his spirit has power. The same principle applies. So we should be people that are walking in faith and not by sight. So I have the blessing of asking my brother to come up here and sharing with you. And then... We're going to have this modeled for us. Hmm? You didn't, it didn't get sent. I asked them. It wasn't sent. Yeah. Did you send it? You told me you're going to send the unedited copy. Is it? it was, oh, I failed. See, this is re- this is real life ministry. See, this is what this is. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. I do not speak on behalf of the elders. I agree with that. No, I'm just saying. I, I think that was from the Lord. Thank you for your obedience. Um, if you, did everyone hear that? Okay, what is your name, sir? Robert? Maryland uh, a few years ago, and I was under a ventilator for 28 days, and uh, the doctor gave me 20 minutes to live, and I, I prayed uh, to the Lord, and I had hallucinations that uh, uh, there's a feller that was uh, on a deathbed or what have you. Uh, I was visualizing in a military hospital. I was in the military, but I was never in a military hospital. And I said something that I I wished that if I came close to healing over, I would say, and that was the same thing that Jesus said in, on the cross, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And I said those words, and I was set free. And then after that, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I said, oh boy. So my prayers were a little bit different there. I said, thy will be done. So I went through 25 days of radiation. That's fine. Last week or so, the Bible study group, we had a friend, uh, one of the fellows was baptized. I went to the baptismal, uh, and I was baptized in the Catholic Church when I was a baby. But I the preacher, what have you, said that uh, that's never really baptized. You have to be submerged or what have you. And I thought about it. I said, all right. So anyway, I was submerged, and I came out and I said what I had to say. So I came to the church. I said to my grandson about the, um, 
about the cross up there, and he said you're being maybe super critical. Uh, and uh, maybe I am, but at the same time, I felt urged to say that because that cross represents Jesus Christ. But the cross there without the inscription, King of the Jews, doesn't, it doesn't say something to me. But the inscription up there tells me it's a Christian church, and that's what it's all about. And that's why I said right. God bless you. God bless you. So just so you know, you're better than a video, because we because we didn't have the video we planned, because God had you planned. See, here's the beauty of of real ministry. It ain't always planned. So everything that Eric has been teaching us, the instruction of it to give us the mindset, it's not a formula. See, if we're not open, see, you not only, he, the Lord, if I can say, brother, he gave you spiritual eyes. What we were seeing in the natural, he showed you in the spiritual. He showed you what it represents and what it needs to further acclaim Jesus. When you're praying for someone and your heart and your passion is for Jesus and that person, he will often illuminate something to you in the spiritual that you never realize. It comes up like a desire. It's a heart's desire. All he's asking us to do is to be humbly obedient, right? That was humble obedience. When you could have selfishly prayed for your own healing, the Lord had changed your heart, right? Thy will be done. That is a beautiful thing. But you know, those things don't always happen until we have experienced some of the releasing and healing and, and time with Jesus ourselves. Eric asked a question a minute ago. How many of you believe that God can heal through prayer? Right? Okay, that's everybody. How many of you believe that God can heal through your prayer? Not quite as many hands went up. You notice that? That's because we underestimate who we are in Christ. We underestimate the beauty and the power of his commissioning to us. It's not that Paul, Paul wrote about being a soldier, but he didn't want us to have the mentality of only being a soldier. He wanted us to be obedient and do it without question. But he wanted us to have the heart and the passion of a healer that everybody we prayed for is with the expectation Jesus is going to do something. It's our expectation. So one of the things why laying of hands is so important to me, I, I'm learning because I also counsel. Laying of hands brings together two of the most powerful things in the universe. Eric has already touched on one, the power of human touch. It's within our DNA. I can show you brain scans of three-year-olds in comparison to those that were not touched well and, one, and ones who were. It literally constricts the growth of our brain. That's how deeply it's ingrained in our chemistry. It's called failure to thrive. It's a core need that we will always have. It's not greater than our need for Jesus, but he invented it and created it because it's that important. And the second thing is the power of communion of two people. What did he say when two or more are gathered? I am there in the midst. When your heart and your compassion for another person is there, so is Jesus. Now we know that Jesus could also heal without touching, right? He healed servants. He healed the, the centurion servants. In fact, he marveled at his faith when he said, no, you don't need to come to my house and touch. You, you, you can do it right here. So 
So Jesus marvels at our faith. But we also see him touching. He touched ears. He touched eyes. He touched mouths. He touched hands. He touched heads. He did a lot of touching. It's not a question of whether you have to. It's not a formula. I think he did it because he also enjoyed it. He liked being that close to his wretched creation so that he could be, have his hands dirty with them and, and enjoy their celebration and the resurrection. We get the same privilege. But we gotta have, we gotta lay down the enemy's lies, put them aside, and just walk by faith. So, rather than have each other do it on each other this morning, we're gonna do a little different. Just for you, just for you, those of us who are not that ready to touch strangers, okay? We're going to start you off. See, I see some of your faces You're like, okay, that's good, because I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do. If you, if you sense a yearning to pray for somebody, and even to lay hands on them, first thing we do is clear the atmosphere. We create a runway. Even before you lay hands on them, I want to do that right now because we're, going to, we're just going to clear the atmosphere for our brother to receive whatever your prayers offer. Let's do that first. Lord Jesus, we're just here together in your name, in your presence. We're just seeking healing, Lord, whatever that looks like in Eric's life. We do ask you, Lord, in order to prepare us, would you clear away all distractions? Lord, would you empty us of any bitterness or unforgiveness. Would you release fear from us, Lord, that because we know that perfect love casts out all fear. So, Lord, first we just receive your love for us. We thank you that you are precious and holy. And we ask you to have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you just for practice this morning, whatever your heart's desire, as you would pray for Eric, I want you to reach your hand toward him and allow me to touch him on your behalf, but I want you first just to pray out loud, even quietly to yourself, your prayer for him. Whatever the Lord leads you to pray for him, I ask you to do that now, and I will close. I will close in a prayer. Hear us, Lord Jesus. Lord, hear our words, meditations of our heart and our words, Lord. Bring the, words, bring the words from us, Lord. Loose the tongues, Lord, that we would hear their prayers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I want you to continue praying. My invitation is that you would speak, that you would speak. Even at a volume that you and Jesus can hear, but I want you to form the words and to speak the prayer. The world was formed as, as God spoke. Speak the words. That's it. In the presence of God, there is crying out, holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Lord.
Lord, I lay, lay hands on my brother and just come in agreement with my brothers and sisters. Lord, I just pray Jesus on him. Just pray Jesus on his mind. I pray Jesus, Lord, that you would illuminate his eyes to Scripture and open up deeper truths that he has never seen before. Lord, that he would see with his eyes the glory of God. Lord, that he would receive all that you have for him, that the old is gone and the new has come. Lord, I pray for his will. It is the enemy attempts to steal, kill, and destroy your partnership with him. I pray that he will continue to walk free of those chains, that his will will be conformed to you, O Lord, that his choices would be godly and spiritually led that he would have victory over his flesh in any, any, any passions that may be formed from the flesh. Lord, we speak death to those right now in the name of Jesus. And for his emotions, Lord, the seed of his soul, the heart of his soul, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you heal all of his emotions, any fears, any loneliness, any doubts, any instabilities, Lord, whatever the enemy has cast before now, we kill today in the name of Jesus. We put the serpent under our feet, Lord, in what he attempted to do, but he has not been victorious because our brother has prevailed in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Not only for what he has overcome, but what is ahead for him to enjoy and the fresh fields for him to walk in as he walks with us and, and leads us as he follows you. So Lord, we just ask you to give him and for him to receive all that you have for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to say one thing. It takes practice to go from heart to mouth. It just takes practice. It releases something in us. And you'll find as you practice it, don't be ashamed of what comes out. If it's from your heart, it's from Christ, you've already asked him to help you, what comes out of you will be Christ. The only thing we can do to hold that ministry of transformation back is to not have the courage to speak it. Let her rip. I promise you, if you don't do it perfect, God will not take your advice, okay? He'll still do his own thing. <laughs> and he won't be offended that you tried to redirect him in the wrong way. He really won't. So don't be afraid to speak. Thank you, brother. So... Thank you for your prayers. Starting on the first Sunday of the month, we're going to start there. So March 3rd, in the Covenant Room, the corner of the rectory, sort of like that way, we're going to have a prayer time. And we want you to come, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, we want you to come and say that. And if you want to be healed, we want you to come and say that. But we're going to start off with once a month. But that doesn't preclude every Sunday that we're here, and frankly, most of you have my phone number, we will come and pray for you. But if after, churches, after church on Sundays, if you want prayer, come grab one of us. We'll be happy to do that. I've got some physical touch going on there. And I was like, she's like, she's like, you're choking her. <laughs> but this is where we want to go as a church. And it's really going to be your decision whether you want to cooperate with what God says is true. If you want to, if you go back a couple weeks, if you want to choose that you want to drive and be a disciple... You've got to walk in it. You've got to practice it. 
and God will bless. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here.